And Dave Sussman back with you at Whiskey Politics live from Freedom Fest. And I'm delighted to have with us Ross Douthat. Ross, uh, you are with the New York Times. And so they tell me. So yes. they tell you. And you are amongst freedom-loving people here. Many have an opinion of the New York Times, and I know you're I've, an opinion. I've, many of them have shared that opinion with me. You're an opinion editor, but uh, a lot of people uh, may not know this, uh, meeting you today. You're also a film critic for the National Review. Yep. Not exactly a left of center publication. Nope. So um, I wanted to discuss with you right now, your perspective as a New York Times opinion editor, what is their own perspective of themselves inside the New York Times? Well, first of all, I mean, there's so I'm a columnist, right? So right. my job is to be opinionated, to argue, to represent generally a sort of right of center perspective on the paper. On, on the paper. Um, so I don't have sort of a front row seat to how the newsroom runs. The, the people who are sort of reporters covering the White House and so on, I'm not, you know, I can't give you intimate details of, of, of that kind of thing. I have much more of a general sense of things. And my general sense, I mean, I, I think, you know, the Times, and I think people who run the paper have been pretty upfront about this, the Times never expected Donald Trump to be president. Most people who right. worked there expected Hillary Clinton to be president. Um, we get, we have a readership that obviously tends to skew more liberal. Um, we have a officially adversarial relationship with the president where, you know, he tweets attacks on our fake news and so on. Um, but at the same time, behind the scenes, he loves to talk to New York Times reporters and is constantly calling them up and so on. Um, and on the op-ed page, I think there's a general sense among the people who I work for, the editors there and so on, that the election of Trump is a sign that, you know, the page needs to sort of open up to a more diverse range of opinions after the election. And so this has meant trying to hire more voices, both on the right and on the left. Um, and in fact, the op-ed page has taken a lot of grief for a couple of the sort of conservatives and libertarians, Brett Stevens and Barry Weiss, who they hired from the Wall Street Journal. They took a lot of grief from liberals for those hires. Um, but I, I think the read there is that, you know, the Trump election was sort of proof that part, proof that a big part of the American media lives in too much of a bubble and needs to break out of that bubble and sort of widen its perspective, widen the range of opinions that people are exposed to. And that view is in tension with, I think, the views of a lot of times readers who want the paper to just be like the voice of the resistance. Um, and so one thing I say to conservatives that, and libertarians that always surprises them is, not always, but often surprises them, is that, you know, there's a huge segment of the Times' readership that is thinks the Times is biased not in favor of Donald Trump, but that they have just gone, not hard enough on that they him. aren't hard enough on him. That, right. that they've that they've normalized him, that they cover him the way they would any other Republican president, and that really the paper, you know, and that by hiring more conservative columnists and so on, they've pandered to something that should be resisted. And so the Times is in this weird position where, you know, it has its usual critics on the right. There are a lot of people who think that they're way too hard on Trump, but then a big segment of its readership thinks that it needs to swing further to the left. Do you think that's justified? Do you think the... Who's? Which? The, okay, that's... <laughs> so the, uh, the the negativity, the criticism that comes from the right over, over some of the coverage of the left. See, I, I take a look at the last eight years before Trump, and a lot of people will say that the Times was extremely soft. If you compare um, speeches in Europe, right? I mean, the fact of the matter is, is that... Um, you know, he, uh, President Obama did talk to NATO about putting in their fair share. Where yep. was the outrage? Uh, President Obama did separate families in 2014. Where was the outrage? And so do you understand that criticism? Yeah. Well, and I, and I mean, look, I think, I mean, I'm a conservative and I think the basic conservative critique of the news media has always been true, right? Which is that, you know, if you have institutions where almost all the people who work there are liberals and vote for Democrats, um, that even if, as I think my colleagues at the Times try to do, even if you are trying your best to be objective, the fact is that perfect objectivity is impossible, and having that kind of skew in newsrooms shapes the kind of coverage you get and probably biases most mainstream institutions, the Times included, somewhat towards the left. Right. Um, and what, what I think, though, that conservatives need to keep in mind, especially sort of, you know, defenders of Donald Trump, 
is that this Trump is distinct from a t he's not just not a Democrat, right? He's also distinct from a typical Republican politician in all kinds of ways. And if you look back to the primary campaign, you know, most Republican nominees don't have National Review running a never Trump cover story. Most Republican nominees don't have, um, you know, the people like Ted Cruz refusing to endorse them for months and months, um, going going till well after the convention. Most people don't, most Republican nominees don't have the kind of resistance among a lot of conservative writers and intellectuals that Trump engendered. And Trump engendered that resistance because, you know, to take the example of NATO, right? I mean, Barack Obama and a, a Republican president might might both sort of push NATO as Trump has pushed them to spend more on defense. But a typical candidate for president doesn't sort of muse about how, you know, he's not sure why we're in NATO anyway, and, you know, express various sympathies for Vladimir Putin and so on. And this is part of, you know, it's part of a long list of things that Trump did differently. And to some people, it's part of his appeal. But I don't think it should be surprising that when you get a president in who sort of delights in breaking norms, right, in, you know, tweeting and attacking and sort of doing doing all these things that presidents don't normally do, that the media reacts with more hysteria, let's say, than even a normal Republican would produce. And I think conservatives who support Trump need to remember how their own media reacted to Trump when he was first running for president and shouldn't be surprised to see some of that same reaction playing out in the more mainstream press. New York Times, Washington Post, they're both hometown newspapers of very liberal towns, but many would look at them as national newspapers. And I think that's why they yep. are at the sphere of, of, of the criticism. Um, but let's talk about from a more of a macro standpoint, if you will, sure. the state of journalism, okay, across the country. My oldest son, he's 18 years old, he wants to go into journalism. He wants to do what you do. Where are we with the state of journalism today? Clickbait, internet, the small town newspapers. What does the landscape look like? I mean, basically, we're in the aftermath of a of a revolution in which people are still trying to sort of sort out what what that revolution means. You know, 15 or 20 years ago, you had a you know you had no internet to speak of. You had a model of journalism that was based on you know large urban newspapers selling advertisements to car dealers and running classified ads and making tons of money right. that way. And that whole economic base just evaporated with the arrival of the internet. And so the internet, and then at the same time, the internet multiplied platforms. It let, you know, anybody could start a blog, anybody could have a podcast. It democratized media in various ways, but it did so while also cutting out the economic base that sort of the traditional institutions depended on. And what's happened since then, I think, is that national operations, the Times is included, have adapted pretty effectively to that. Um, and and have a, but, but that adaptation has meant that they are more dependent on audience, on clickbait, on, you know, the Times increasingly we make money off subscriptions. And of course, you know, that means that you're a little bit more of a prisoner of your audience than you were when you were making all your money off classifieds. And that in turn shapes and sometimes limits how different outlets and publications cover things. And then at the same time, this sort of level below that, um, I was talking about this on a panel I was just on, the sort of right. mid-sized daily newspapers, the Baltimore Suns and you know the Cleveland paper, the Detroit paper, the Denver paper, they've just been hollowed out and nothing has replaced them. So it's a great time in certain ways to go into journalism to cover national politics. There's never been as much coverage of national politics. Um, but there's a lot of sort of serious, hard-hitting investigative journalism that used to get done below the national level that isn't getting done anymore. And for your son, I mean, professionally, journalism 20 years ago was a profession where you could sort of, you could imagine it as a sort of stable upper middle class profession. Not, doesn't pay as well, but sort of comparable to going to law school and becoming a lawyer, you know, and, and you know, you, you could go and rise through these different newspapers and end up like my wife was at the Baltimore Sun and work there for 20 years and have that just be, you know, raise a family, live in a house in the Baltimore suburbs, have that be your profession. And now, in certain ways, it's returning to its more working class, blue collar roots, but it's also just generally much more of a hustle. There's much more job switching, there's much more of a gap between, you know, people scrambling to make 30000 a year doing journalism and people like a Ben Shapiro who sort of builds an empire yeah. on his own and, and does really well. And so there's, 
you know, when I give advice to young people, I say, you know, you go into journalism and you work absolutely as hard as you can for the first five years. You write for anyone who will pay you to write. You go anywhere that has a job for you. And then as you enter your late 20s and you're thinking about, you know, whether you're going to have a family, where you want to live, all these things, you have to make a decision about whether this is really the life for you. Going back to the clickbait issue, I mean, you, you, you referred to this earlier and, and you talked about this on a panel as well. If you are serving ab about eyeballs, it's about eyeballs, so if you're serving your audience about getting as much of an audience as possible, does that in any way filter out truth? Does that in any way filter out content or, uh, or, or, or what? In other words, are you giving people what they want to hear as opposed to what they should be hearing? Of course. And again, it's not, this is not a completely new thing. And in certain ways, it's a return to how American newspapers worked in the 19th century, right? Where you had Democrat and Republican newspapers, you had, you know, newspapers had much more of a partisan identity than they do right. now. Um, so it's not, it's not a new thing, but the internet does make it more immediate. You write a piece and you immediately know how many people are reading it. You immediately know how much audience engagement it has. So every publication is in this bind where if you're a serious place and you're trying to do serious stuff, you don't want to just become a clickbait factory, but at the same time, you have to, you know, throw some incense to the gods of clickbait, yeah, if you will. Yeah. You can't, you can't. So, for instance, the Times, you know, to pick a Times example, you probably follow this Alan Dershowitz, right, mm -hmm. who's been a very public defender of Trump on legal grounds in it's various persona ways. Persona non grata. As, right, he, he talked about how he's persona non grata on Martha's Vineyard. Um, now, is this the biggest news story in the history of the world? Probably not, but it involves a celebrity, a celebrity academic, um, Martha's Vineyard. So yeah, rich, rich yeah. people. Um, it's the kind of story that people want to click on. And so the Times, we ran a bunch of. We had some reporters on Martha's Vineyard talking to people. We, you know, we interview, did an interview with Dershowitz, and a lot of people criticized us for this right and left and said, well, this is ridiculous. You know, this is not an important story. What's happening in Alan Dershowitz's social life? Right, right. Um, and you can defend it. You can say, well, it's part of this larger, you know, polarization and of social life and so on. But, but it really was. It was something that our readers were interested in. And so we did a bunch of stories on it. And you have to accept, you, you have to find a balance between any publication has to find that balance. You have to accept that you're going to do some of that stuff because it's a business and you're trying to serve your readers. Yeah. But you have to use the money and the audience that you build doing that to continue to do the, mo the more hard-hitting coverage. And there are places where that just sort of falls apart. You mentioned on the panel, this is my last question on the macro aspect of the media. I've I got a couple of political questions for you. You mentioned on the panel that you said distrust in the media really started with distrust from the government, going all the way back to Vietnam. Yep. Is that correct? Yeah, I, I think that if you look at trends of distrust in media, they track distrust of politics and distrust of um, um, basically every American institution except the military has seen sort of trust and respect crater over the last 30, 40, 50 years. And I think that that reflects sort of two, mostly two waves of elite failure. You had this period from the mid-60s to sort of the late 70s where nothing seemed to go right in America. Right. We lost the Vietnam War, you had the Watergate scandal, um, you had sort of, you know, social breakdown, a huge crime wave, um, you know, you, you had, um, by, the late, by the late 70s, you had stagflation, and this just, you had all this public trust that had been built up by World War II by the sense that, you know, people in charge know what they're doing, and it was squandered. And then there was this sort of slow rebuilding across the Reagan era, in the 1990s that sort of peaked after 9-11, where people felt this surge of patriotism. And then, you know, the Iraq war went badly, there were no weapons of mass destruction, you had a financial crisis, and suddenly it was just back to the people running things don't know what they're doing. And the press, the failures of the press are part of this, but there, it's, I would say, it's more that the press is seen as part of the elite, and the elite in general is seen as, you know, relative to 1945 to 65, not knowing what they're doing. It's true that journalists generally, by and large, consider themselves for the underdog, right? You go into journalism because you want to report those stories that may right. not be being reported. Um, subsequently, you have 80, 90% of journalists considering themselves politically to the left, right, yep. left of center. That doesn't have any impact on the trust, you don't think? It's, oh, I know. I think it does. It does. I think it does. Okay. But it, I don't think it's a... Ch no, of course. But I think that that also you know, reflects 
you know, the, the institutions, a lot of the major cultural institutions in the United States and also, you know, the universities, the legal establishment and so on are seen as liberal as well. And as the country has polarized politically, um, they've become seen as, you know, more, more partisan, more associated with the left. And so people trust them less. Um, but I think it's, again, I, I'm, I'm not disputing that. I'm just saying I think it's bound up in this larger lack of trust. But also, yeah, I mean, the polarization, too, flows from, it flows out of the 60s in part, too. It flows out of, you know, institutions that were center-left in 1955 once the baby boomers sort of took them over, became more self-consciously liberal. Right, And right. people who are more conservative, you know, recognized that happening. You know, Hollywood 1977 is very different from Hollywood in 1957. Yeah, could John um, Wayne get a job today in a movie? Right. Probably. Probably, yeah, probably. But If Mel Gibson can still be hired to direct movies, John Wayne could yeah. probably get a job. Um, let's talk about current events. Mueller investigation. You've compared that to the Whitewater investigation in the 1990s of Bill Clinton. You've said that there's some similarities there. It, it, well, it, I was, it, no, I was only comparing it because, you know, there are critics of Mueller who will say, well, this has been going on. It's been going on for a year. Okay. It's been going on long enough. And that may be true. All I was saying was that historically these investigations, Iran-Contra, Whitewater, into, you know, up into Monica Lewinsky often tended to go on for several years. I think it's likely that we'll get a report from Mueller, you know, within six months, that possibly even this fall. And in hindsight, it won't seem like the investigation lasted lasted that long. I mean, I, I'm basically an agnostic on the Mueller investigation. I, I think people on both sides are way too confident about, you know, that it's, you know, that there's absolutely nothing there or, you know, that it's going to bring down the president or something. And I'm just trying, I, I think, as I said on this, the panel, that there's a lot of media hysteria about Trump and Russia, um, but that Mueller himself, I think, has behaved reasonably well, you know, that he's indicted people who, for the most part, probably deserve to be indicted. And so, I'm waiting to see what the final report says before I pass judgment on whether the whole thing was a fishing expedition or not. We had Ken Starr on an episode um, right after the election, and it was actually really interesting to see because it was just after Trump had won, and he, he talked about the trajectory of how the Clintons going back to, from the 1980s actually may have led to the election results. Um, oh, but yeah. Trump, what, Trump would never have won. Not never, but Trump would have been unlikely to have won if people didn't see Hillary as corrupt in very particular ways that go back to those right to, to this the sordid stuff in the 90s and 80s yeah and one of the things that's interesting though is if you take a look at the Whitewater investigation which for those that don't know history it was about Whitewater it was a land development deal in Arkansas that went bad but what Trump I'm sorry what <laughs> President Clinton ended up with a, a, the impeachment for uh, was lying perjury Okay, over, um, right. over, we know what happened in the Oval Office with Monica Lewinsky. Is that, is, is that of concern to you from a journalistic standpoint of, of how widespread these investigations can go? Because oh, oh, yeah, absolutely. And I, I, again, I, I think if you, end up, if you end up with Mueller saying, you know, that, that Trump should be impeached because of some, you know, sleazy business deal he did in 1986 or something, or, not, or 2004, then that then the investigation will look, as I said, like a fishing expedition, basically. That for, well, that's, for the isn't that what Manafort is? I mean, he's sitting in uh, solitary confinement right now for something that happened 20, 30 years ago. Well, some of the Manafort stuff was more recent than that. And Manafort is, I mean, you know, he's, he is actually pretty clearly guilty <laughs> of these crimes. Um, right, but so, what, did so that that, that, what did that have to do with Donald Trump? Why was that in the investigation? And I'm not standing up for Man because, Manafort. Because I'm just Trump, asking. Because Trump hired Manafort to be his campaign manager at the right. same time that people associated with Russia were, you know, were doing hacking and other things to try and interfere with our election. So it's, it's at least... There's a pretty clear, I mean, it's as if, you know, I don't know what exactly the precise analogy would be, but it's, it's as if Clinton, in the course of the Whitewater investigation, it had turned out that Clinton had hired someone who was involved with a different criminal thing in Arkansas, and then that person was Web indicted for that. Well, but <laughs> Webb Hubble probably, did, I mean, the people indicted around Whitewater right. I think, deserve to be indicted. And in the same way, I mean, again, I'm just, <clears throat> I think, you know, in order for, 
the Mueller investigation to justify what liberals have poured into it, you need it to end with, yeah, some actual proof that the Trump campaign colluded directly with the Russians to disseminate Democratic National Committee emails. And I'm skeptical that, it'll, that it will end with that. But if it ends with a report that says, you know, Trump hired a bunch of seamy people who had committed crimes and were prosecuting them for those crimes, um, and the Russians did interfere in these ways, but we have no proof of collusion, then I think the story will sort of go away in six months or so. And I think you'll be able to say Mueller did his job and liberal partisans were hysterical about it. Last question for you. The uh, current events as they are right now, we've got Senate hearings, uh, in fact, congressional hearings. You've got uh, Peter Strzok, Lisa Page might be coming to talk. You talk about distrust in the institutions. One mm -hmm. of the greatest institutions is obviously our Justice Department, our FBI, right? And here you have these two individuals. And you relate that to journalism from a standpoint of trust or distrust, I should say, as well. What are your thoughts about what we're seeing right now with that particular issue? I mean, again, I'm sort of agnostic <laughs> there, too. I mean, I, I think okay. what you're seeing is the same polarization where, you know, there is a liberal interpretation. You know, liberals are convinced that the Justice Department, that the FBI and the Justice Department threw the election to Trump. They're at, because that reopening, reopening the investigation just a week before the election and having Comey get up and make a statement about it, that that effectively let Donald Trump win. And conservatives are convinced that what happened then and then after the election reflected deep FBI and Justice Department bias and a desire to overturn the election. And, you know, it's more, li it's more likely that people in general, you know, people have their biases, but it's often more reasonable to explain it via sort of incompetence. And, and I mean, what, you know, one of, one of the lessons is that the deep state exists and it's really incompetent. <laughs> That's that's one takeaway from right, all of this. Right. And it's a guy, you know, in the end, it's a guy who's supposed to be this upright guy texting with his mistress and, you know, and, and doing deeply inappropriate things. But as far as I can see, that doesn't rise to the level of proof that, you know, that there was an explicit attempt to frame Donald Trump. It's more just that we've exposed, you know, exposed sordidness and hack work and incompetence without it proving the conservative case. Okay. Well, it's going to be interesting to see this, how, how this evolves. As a movie critic, movie that we should see. One movie, 2018 so far. I mean, it's. I don't think it's been a good year for movies. I think this is a, a sort of conventional choice, but I think A Quiet Place, the sort of horror movie about the family living in a rural house, J John Krasinski and Emily Blunt, and it's a sort of a monster movie about monsters who hunt by sound. And so it's this family that's trying to protect their children by making sure they never make a sound. And as the parent of a seven-year-old, a five-year-old, and a two-year-old, this was an amazing and terrifying thing to watch. Uh -oh. um, but a very that's that's the movie I'd recommend, A Quiet Place. A Quiet Place. All right. Where people can find you? Twitter? New York, Twitter, New York Times on Sundays and Wednesdays online. Uh, Twitter at uh, Douth at NYT. Um, and on fine podcasts like this one. Fantastic. Russ Douthat, thank you so much Absolutely. for taking the time. Absolutely. Thank you, Dave. This is a lot of fun. And find us, Whiskey Politics. Find, uh, follow me at David Sussman on Twitter. And find us, subscribe to us at YouTube. And we'll be back real soon at Whiskey Politics. Thanks for joining us.